so. Yeah, it's like the most tech office I've seen in Canvas, I think. Yeah. So we're trying to figure out. Come on in. Or hang out in the hallway. Either one. Come oh, in, come I'm out. Sorry, it's okay. Sorry, no, no worries. I'd rather be in here. Maybe. No worries. <laughs> Get something out of it. Yeah. So, if we're going to make a tri hybrid genotype, then what haplotypes or what gametes can come together to make this genotype? So we know from each parent, these are two different parents down the middle. Mm -hmm. So we've got, say, dad on one side and mom on the other side. So what letters do their gametes, the haplotypes, have to contain to produce that set of genotypes? There are lots of options. Big and big. Big and big. Okay, so you could put big A, so each gamete, each haplotype has to have one of each letter, mm -hmm. right? So you say you want big A with big B, and then you have to have a C also. Which C do you want? Okay. Which I'm going to make purposefully big. So that means that the other, the egg for mom had, yeah, the little A, the little B, and the little C. Okay. So then, what genotypes, and this, again, this is no one right answer. Mm -hmm. You just make something up, as long as it's correct. What are the genotypes of the parents that can produce haplotypes that look like that? There has to be at least one big A and something else. And there has to be at least one big B and some other version of B. And there has to be at least one big C and something else. And the same is true for this parent. little c. So you can fill in what's empty up there in the genotypes with any sort of a, b, c, whatever. Mm -hmm. That's all right. That's the answer to the first question. And the second question, the related question in the exam was find a different genotype that you can use, if I remember correctly, is use a different genotype. It's the exact same question. You just can't reuse oh, yeah. the same genotypes and haplotypes. Mm -hmm. So what's another set of haplotypes, I'll draw it on the same picture, I'll just use a different color. What's a different set of haplotypes that you can use to make that same F1 genotype? So instead of having all the capital letters on one side and all the lowercase on the other, what else could you do? Big A, no C. Big, or yeah, you could do big A, big B, little c from that parent, and that means that to get the same F1 genotype, what has to be the haplotype of the other gamete? Small B, Small B big C, and little a. Would switching the, uh, the uh, with the male and the female, would just switching them up, would that be a valid answer? No. <laughs> no. Not for this. So, yeah, in nature that works. But for this question, I'm asking is specifically to use different haplotypes than were used in the previous one. So you, they would be, if you just swapped them yeah. this way, they would be using the same haplotypes. Okay. So I'm just, so the point I'm trying to make is that there are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of different crosses you can set up at the top that wind up giving you the same F1 genotype. So there's the plus one nucleotide. How does RNA polymerase know to go there? And start transcribing. What's upstream? Okay, so upstream of the start site, this is the region of the gene that we call the promoter, which is where all the regulatory elements exist. So what do those DNA sequences do? Or what recognizes those DNA sequences? What's this blob I just drew in there? In lac operon, what would this be? That's the isn't that the capsule before the promoter? Because I 
So a promoter is a big yeah, region yeah. upstream of a gene that contains mm -hmm. a lot of DNA sequences that a lot of proteins bind to. So in the LAC system, what is this black blob I drew up there in the upper left? Instead of the promoter, that would be called the operator. Right. And the protein that binds the operator is repressor. LAC repressor. In eukaryotes, and in prokaryotes too, there are proteins that turn off transcription. That's the repressor. There are also proteins that turn on transcription, and they bind to DNA sequences that are in the promoter. And that's this part of that protein has a DNA interaction surface. So that part of the protein recognizes a specific DNA, DNA sequence. And then there's this whole face of the protein, and it is a protein-protein interaction domain. In other words, that's part of a protein that recognizes and binds to a specific protein. Mm -hmm. What specific protein does this not, this is not lac repressor anymore, this is eukaryotic, this is something that's going to turn on transcription. What protein does it interact with? It interacts with RNA polymerase. So, step one, transcription factor. Mm -hmm. The most common one that we've talked about in eukaryotes is Tata binding protein. So that would make this DNA sequence that recognizes TNA, TATA, -TA, that would make this transcription factor Tata binding protein. And Tata binding protein, first step, binds to DNA. Second step, it's sitting there on the promoter. It grabs RNA polymerase and pulls it to the DNA and says, this is where a transcription start site is. That's basically how transcription initiation begins. So through the TBP, the Tata binding protein. Yeah. That tells the RNA polymerase that I'm also here for you. Basically, yeah. Yeah, okay. So it's a DNA sequence that a specific protein binds, the Tata binding protein. And then there's a protein protein interaction. So, in other words, okay, I'm going to use the word translate. It has nothing to do with amino acids. <laughs> Tata binding protein translates for RNA polymerase where the genes exist. So DB, TBP is the interpreter, in mm -hmm. other words. It reads the DNA and says, and it lay, lays down on transcription start sites. And that's how RNA polymerase knows where the genes are, mm -hmm. is where TBP is. Okay. Just like the guy in Yeah, basically. Yeah. Now, that's initiation. On the other end, that's what this question that you're asking about is asking about. Which How does RNA polymerase know where to stop transcribing? So there's another DNA sequence. In, let's talk eukaryotes. Mm -hmm. We can do prokaryotes as well. But there's another specific DNA sequence at the end of genes that causes transcription to stop. That is... Anybody? Yes, another protein. Okay. There's a specific six nucleotide sequence, AAUAAA. That's the polyadenylation signal sequence, is its formal name. Poly what? Poly A, polyadenylation. Poly A signal sequence. And when RNA polymerase moves down the DNA and gets there. I'm leaving out some details. You could go back and look at the lecture from transcription if you want to. But basically, that DNA sequence signals the end of transcription. Just the sequence itself? No protein, nothing else? There are proteins that are involved as well. Yeah. So what really happens is RNA polymerase transcribes past that signal sequence but there are other proteins that recognize that mm -hmm. specific six nucleotide sequence. It's not RNA polymerase. There are other proteins which we haven't talked about the details of. Mm. And when those proteins see that AAUAAA mm -hmm. in the RNA, so R RNA polymerase has moved past, it's mm -hmm. created a messenger RNA that has that six sequence. nucleotide sequence, oh. then the proteins that recognize that sequence in RNA mm -hmm. basically tell RNA polymerase, you're done. They actually physically remove RNA polymerase from the DNA at that point. More importantly, there's a separate enzyme that cuts the end of the RNA molecule about... Okay, so let's see. 
there's a start codon and a stop codon. This messenger RNA is going to have to be a little bit longer for me. This is for translation, right? This is, well, this is the messenger RNA. So that we're still talking about what's the messenger RNA molecule that gets produced. It will contain, somewhere in that gene, there will be a start codon mm -hmm. that's encoded by the DNA, and there will be a stop codon. Those will be to the left of, five prime of, the poly A signal sequence. Mm -hmm. So it's also going to be, so actually, that's a DNA sequence. I've screwed this up. That really should be T. Because that's DNA. Mm -hmm. So the okay. DNA sequence will have A, T, A, A, A. But the mRNA will have A, A, U, A, A, A. And then about 15 to 20 nucleotides of additional gene sequence mm -hmm. before it stops. And that's where there's a separate enzyme, which it's not important to know the details of, cuts the RNA molecule about 15 to 20 nucleotides past that AAU, AAA. And then a separate enzyme, poly A polymerase, adds a bunch of A's to the very end of the messenger RNA. That was the third step in RNA processing in eukaryotes. 7-methylguanine cap on the left end, mm -hmm. splicing, and adding of this poly A, mini A tail. So that AAU AAA is where transcription termination is all, that's what it's all about. It's that sequence of six nucleotides, and then we leave it up to the proteins that recognize that sequence mm -hmm. to actually carry out the job of stopping RNA polymerase from doing work. And that's the starting point of its end. Yes. <laughs> like, not there's a process anything. after. That's correct. Yeah, but that's yeah. that's where. That's it, what initiates termination. That's the beginning of the end. The beginning of the end. <laughs> I think that was bothering me. Couldn't solve. Mm -hmm. I couldn't remember. Yeah. And it's it's absolutely common. Everybody almost has this issue of yeah, transcription translation. Yeah, how the start and stop codons play a role in which process. Yeah, I, and I, I, mix, I mix them. Yeah. And you're not alone. It takes doing this a lot before you really see the bigger picture. And that's what I'm here to try to do, but sometimes I'm not as effective at it as other times. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, I kind of came with the discussion oh, question. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, and the question is, what happens to the operator, which is a specific DNA sequence? I don't remember offhand what the sequence is. Let's just make one up. <laughs> Let's say it's a four nucleotide sequence that lack repressor recognizes and binds to. And what's the circumstance in which repressor binds the operator? No lactose present. Oh, no effector. Right? No lact. Yeah, no. What's the name of the small molecule? Effector. So ACTU would be the operon. I think it's like like ZYA is operon. That's that's right. Oh, okay. So there's that big difference between the two words that start with oper. Yeah. The operon is the set of genes that get transcribed. The operator is part of the promoter, which are the regulatory DNA sequences. That is the DNA sequences that are used by proteins to turn off or turn on transcription. So the operator is part of the promoter. It's got a specific DNA sequence. And in the case where there's no lactose, you've got lac repressor bound to the operator, and that's blocking RNA polymerase from moving down the DNA to the right to get to the transcription start site so it can transcribe the genes. So that doesn't happen when the repressor is bound to the operator. And then if you have plus lactose, so lactose binds the repressor, that causes lac repressor to change shape, so maybe it looks something like that now, so it doesn't have a flat surface that recognizes ACTA. So it changes shape, lactose is still bound to it, and it falls off of the operator. So that DNA sequence, ACTA, is still there. Okay. It's just that the proteins that would recognize it and bind to it can't because lactose has physically changed their shape 
So they're physically unable to bind ACTA. So does the RNA polymerase just stop there, or does it skip over? So then RNA polymerase, there's nothing here, because it's moved off of the DNA. So now RNA polymerase slides, reads the DNA from 5' prime to 3' prime until it gets to the transcription start site, that black arrow here. And starts transcribing. Okay. So the operator is the whole um, thing with the the repressor and everything then? The operator is just the DNA sequence that the repressor binds. Okay. okay. So it's a specific DNA sequence. It's not ACTA necessarily, mm -hmm. but I just made that up. But it is a defined specific DNA sequence that one protein will bind to, and that's in this case live repressor. Okay. Yeah. I think that's the only question I got. Mm -hmm. So and that's what's your name? Uh, my boy, John. Okay. Yeah, we've been emailing this morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, did I'm glad. Did you get my last email? Yeah, did you get my last email? Yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> I don't know. Now I should check. Did I get your last email? Who was the last person that fired off an email? If, if it was the one that said, yeah, you're good to go. Yeah. You're, you're all okay. set to, for that okay. topic. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so what was the difference between cis and the trans, um, what was it called? The cis and the trans... Regulation. Yes. Yes. For the plasma. <laughs> all that. Okay. I've got a great description of this from the video I posted from the last office hours. I'm happy to do this now, but I just want you to know that in case this doesn't work, okay. I might say something different today than I did on Monday. Okay. So. Now, as a dutiful student, you've already taken organic chemistry, right? Mm -hmm. Or you are currently taking it. This terminology has nothing to do yeah. <laughs> with double bonds and isomers. Okay. Which is unfortunate, but we use the same words because they're Greek, or at least have Greek roots. Or Latin, trans Latin, cis, I'm not sure, cis might be Greek. So we use cis to mean nearby, mm -hmm. proximal, mm -hmm. and trans to mean far acting. And I'll explain what I mean. But that's the basic idea. Cis elements are almost always, so these are just some bullet points. Cis elements or cis regulation almost always occurs using DNA. And transacting factors are almost always proteins. So that's the summary. And I'll go into detail. But if you remember anything, those are basically the points. Transacting factors are usually proteins, cis-acting factors are usually DNA. And here's why. So we'll talk about exactly the same thing we were just talking about, lac operon, just because it's a familiar example, not because it only happens to lac operon. So let's say we've got, this is exactly the same example I was using in class. Hopefully that means this is useful and not confusing, but we've got two different molecules of DNA. Here we've got the bacterial chromosome, which we know is circular, so I'll just put some dotted lines down there that represent that we're just not showing all of the chromosome. And we could also have a plasmid, a small chromosome, that also has the lac operator sequence. So this is all only going to ever be used for prokaryotic? No, this is also true for eukaryotic. Okay. So I'm just using this example. I could use gal regulation as an example. I could mm -hmm. use any gene, really, for that matter. It doesn't have to be, we can speak about it generically. Let's just say there's a gene. Gene X. <laughs> and... Like, see how I did that? Promoter. Uh-oh, nice P-R-O, promoter. Okay, so we've got a promoter sequence, a DNA sequence. I'm just not showing you the specific sequence because 
Mm -hmm. I don't have to. The promoter is where transcription factors will bind and turn on transcription. Right. If there's a mutation to this promoter, that changes the DNA sequence. So now it's promuter. I don't know. <laughs> now transcription factor won't bind to that sequence. Right. So what's the effect of that mutation on transcription of gene X? So gene X wouldn't be transcribed. Right. No TXN, no transcription, never. Or almost never. It's hard to say never in biology because there's always, almost always some exception. But basically, transcription factor can't bind a mutant promoter because the protein that's the transcription factor doesn't recognize this new DNA sequence. What happens if we put the wild-type promoter sequence on a separate piece of DNA into this eukaryotic, let's say, cell? It wouldn't fix anything. That doesn't fix anything because what's the transcription factor now recognizes the wild type sequence. It can go bind that piece of DNA, mm -hmm. but it still will never go bind promuter. So you still never get transcription of gene X. That's why the promoter, the DNA regulatory element, acts or works in cis. It's only the promoter that's next to the gene it regulates. Mm -hmm. That promoter only regulates the gene it's next to physically. Right. On the other hand, let's say this, let's see, we can add something else. We can add the gene that creates the, so here's the transcription factor gene that produces the protein that is this transcription factor that binds. I should color everything, keep, mm -hmm. keep the color coding going. So we've got the transcription factor gene, and let's say there's a transcription factor gene, there would be, in the normal bacterial chromosome, but it's also mutant. So it creates a transcription factor, in this case, that can't bind the promoter. So this mutation means the protein that that gene encodes is unable to bind the promoter, which means it would have the same effect. by itself. If you just had a chromosome that had a mutant transcription factor gene that created a mutant transcription factor protein that was able to bind the promoter, that transcription factor would never be able to activate transcription. What happens when we install a wild type version of that transcription factor on a second piece of introduced DNA? So wild type transcription factor. So gene. that is the transcription factor that um, identifies like promoter instead of promuter? Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so this, that it would work. this wild type transcription factor gene creates a protein. What does that protein do? It floats all over the cell. It will bind the wild type promoter sequence that's on the plasmid that we added. That's the small little mini chromosome that we can put into bacteria. But it can also transact because it's just, this is a protein, it's floating around in the cell. It can go bind to the original promoter sequence and turn on transcription. So that transcript, this wild type transcription factor gene down in the bottom mm -hmm. has, acts in trans because it produces a protein. Protein's a diffusible element once you make it, it can go anywhere in the nucleus and act on any piece of DNA, in this case, that, that protein recognizes, that is specific DNA sequences that the transcription factor recognizes. So it's got a global activity in the right. nucleus as opposed to something... So like trans actually work to make it work and cis doesn't? Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay. It's just that cis factors are ones that have a local sphere of influence, okay. in other words. Yeah. Cis regulatory elements regulate genes they're near, mm -hmm. physically. Mm -hmm. Transacting factors act anywhere, okay. basically. And that, that's why that 
distinction between DNA as a cis-acting factor and protein as a trans-acting factor is a good rule of thumb. Because okay. DNA elements usually only control transcription nearby. nearby. Mm -hmm. Except for <laughs> what case? There's one case study we've talked about in class where there was a DNA sequence that could be anywhere but still regulates transcription. That was, we were talking about lactose intolerance. Oh, okay. And there was a paper that showed that there was an enhancer of transcription that was in an intron of a gene that was like a thousand or two thousand or more base pairs mm -hmm. upstream of the promoter for the lactase. Was that from the pre-lecture video? Uh, we talked about it in class. I don't think I introduced it in a pre-lecture video. I don't think so. Then I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I'll have to go back and watch the video. Yeah. Okay. So that's the basic gene. So that's where you see DNA methylation when we're talking about epigenetics. The cytosine and CG base pairs, the two next to each other, get methylated. Not always, but sometimes. And when methylation occurs, let's say there's a gene down here on the right. There's a transcription start site where RNA polymerase starts making RNA. So that makes this, in the 5' prime end, the promoter. But what happens at promoters? What's the activity that goes on in this region of genes? What proteins bind in the promoter regions? More specifically, a type of, there's a set of proteins. Part of the surface of that protein recognizes a specific DNA sequence. Those are called DNA binding proteins. But they're also, more specifically, because they turn on transcription, are called transcription what? Factors. So this is particularly true in eukaryotes, but it also works similarly in prokaryotes. The proteins, transcription factors, that bind specific DNA sequences in the promoter, and what do they do? So one, they bind DNA sequences. That's not how you start transcription. How do these proteins actually help turn on transcription? What's the protein that does the work of transcription in blue here? It's one type of polymerase. Which one? Oh, well, what's it making? RNA. Yeah. So RNA polymerase, the enzyme, is the one that does the work of transcription. Reads DNA, produces RNA. So how does RNA polymerase know to go there, that that's where a gene is? We've got billions of nucleotides in our genomes. RNA polymerase can't waste its time floating all over all of our chromosomes and trying to figure out where to start transcribing DNA. And it can't just start transcribing DNA randomly because most of our DNA doesn't encode proteins. So it has to be told, RNA polymerase, the enzyme, has to be told where to start transcription. How does it know? The start codon. It's the transcription factor. So start codon it and stop codon happen after transcription. So the process of reading DNA and making the RNA molecule doesn't have to do with start and stop codons. This is a physical interaction between the transcription factor and RNA polymerase. So the first step in the initiation of transcription is the transcription factor binds the promoter. The second step is that once the transcription factor is bound to DNA, it physically, that's what this blue arrow is meant to represent, the transcription factor protein physically binds to RNA polymerase, drags it over to the promoter and says, this is where a gene is. So RNA polymerase, the enzyme that does transcription, doesn't have any idea where it's supposed to go in the world of the nucleus. 
the transcription factors are the proteins that tell it where to go to do transcription. So to get back to your point, and then we'll have to leave and go over to class, how does methylation of the promoter, these CG dinucleotides, interfere with this process of transcription initiation? Well, it turns out that those methyl groups take up space, and although I've shown them here pointing down, they also point up, because I've, I've drawn a double-stranded nucleus or double helix here. So there's also methyl groups, which are, what, CH3? Sticking up here, CH3, CH3, they're sticking out both sides of the double helix. And that actually can physically block this transcription factor from recognizing the DNA sequence it's looking for to bind to. So that's the 30-second version of methylation and epigenetics. So methylation of DNA basically blocks transcription factors from binding, stops transcription from initiating, stops the production of RNA. And we have enzymes, organisms that do DNA methylation have enzymes that both stick those methyl groups on the cytosines and also separate enzymes that take them off again. So it, it, within a cell, you can change from having your DNA be methylated to not methylated and back again and off and on depending on things like your environment, like, like the asthma case we were discussing. So some of those do get stuck or they can't get off? Oh, you, they're all removable. The question is, then it's, it's dynamic in each of your cells whether or not your methyl transferase enzyme is more active, that's the one that adds methyl groups, versus the methylase enzyme, which is the one that takes them off. So then it's a balancing act between which enzyme is being produced more in your cell. The methyl transferase or is it the methylase? The one that adds methyl groups or the one that takes them off. And there's a lot more detail beyond that, but that's not relevant to this class yet. So, this class ever. <laughs> Future classes, maybe. Is epigenetics the study of methylation affecting all of this? You're right. Epigenetics is broadly the study of how heritable changes that don't change the DNA sequence occur and how those are trans... And methylation is one of them. Methylation is one, acetylation of histones, and methylation of histones, or others. There are lots of different chemical modifications that occur to chromosomes or to the histones that bind to them. But these are the three main ones. Two, methylation and acetylation. Methylation of DNA and both methylation and acetylation of histones. Yep. All right. <laughs>